Hello there, you are watching the press preview, a fast look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. Well, in the next half hour, we'll have a look at what's making the headlines with the columnist for the Irish News, Alison Morris, and the columnist for the Mail on Sunday, Peter Hitchens, who are joining us uh, this evening. So before we do, let's have a quick look at what's on those front pages. The eye leaves with a second government U-turn in 24 hours. That's the fee that foreign NHS workers pay to use the health service, which will now be withdrawn. The Guardian says the decision came after pressure from the Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer and also Conservative backbenchers. The Metro reports on a sharp drop in the number of new COVID-19 cases in London. There's been fewer than 100 in the last fortnight. The development of two new types of tests leads the Mail to ask, could this be the biggest virus hope we've had? The Mirror says that 10 million Britons could benefit from the tests. And that is also the lead story in The Express. According to the Times, people who've recovered from the virus should be given special certificates to exempt them from social distancing. The Telegraph understands that MPs will consider legislation to let police conduct spot checks on the homes of people who've arrived back in Britain to check their adhering to the 14-day quarantine period. Alison's paper, that's the Irish News, reports that children there may not go back to school even after the end of the summer holidays. And this is the main story for the Financial Times. There could be renewed protests in Hong Kong over the Chinese government's plans to impose its own national security laws there. The Sun reports that the girlfriend of an unnamed England footballer was caught carrying a stun gun at an airport. And the Star has details of a parking dispute between Good Morning Britain presenters Piers Morgan and Susanna Reid. Always a paper to choose if you've had enough of COVID-19 coverage. Uh, we're joined now by uh, Alison Morris and Peter Hitchens. Thank you both very much for uh, being uh, with us this evening. We'll start off with a front page story in The Guardian. It's our top story on Sky News this evening as well. Um, the Prime Minister U-turning uh, on this charge that's applied to foreign NHS workers to access healthcare services in the UK. Um, should we be applauding the Prime Minister for being agile enough to change his mind or saying that this is another U-turn? It looks like the government is losing its grip. What do you think, Alison? He was forced into this decision by Labour and by Keir Starmer, challenging him on it. And what, what we have is a situation where politicians are queuing up on a Thursday night to have someone filling them, clapping on their front doorsteps for the NHS workers. And yet when it came down to it, this decision was going to mean that the NHS workers who have kept, kept us afloat, who have kept us safe, you know, the cleaners, the porters, the domestic staff, the care home workers, that those people were going to have to pay a surcharge of £624 and it shows you how are out of touch that the, the government can be if they wouldn't realise that £624 to someone on a very low wage would be just an impossible fee to pay. You know, it would be choosing between that and paying the rent and, and feeding their children. Um, so I think it's good that he's been forced to do a U-turn, but it was a very silly decision in the first place. Um, and I think that it indicates that why they're doing all the, the you know, the show, show clapping at, at, on a Thursday night, they're out of touch with the realities of what's actually happening on the ground. It's interesting to hear you say it was a silly idea all along. Um, Peter, I wonder if you think there's an argument that it shows how much the world has changed since that December election, where this kind of policy may have been relatively popular then, but now people have got such different views on things like this. Well, it's partly that. It's also partly that they should have realised, I think, much more quickly that it was going to be a problem because they did portray themselves as a sort of Labour Party in the December election and captured a lot of Labour seats by saying, particularly, that they were in love with the NHS in a way that, uh, that even outdistanced the Labour Party's unending proclaimed love affair with the NHS. So you would have thought somebody would see it. I think the, the, the problem is that there is a great shortage of money. And that some people said, well, we've got to put in some sort of charge for this because otherwise the NHS is going to be short of a great deal of money. And that is always the problem, the, the great conflict between the Treasury saying there isn't any money and the politicians saying, yes, but we look stupid on this occasion, looking stupid, Trump not having any money. But where they'll find the money from will be interesting to see. It, uh, it, it is an immensely expensive thing keeping the NHS going, as, uh, as we're going to discover as the tax base falls after this catastrophic shutdown of the economy. Yeah, that certainly does feel like it's uh, the next major story uh, coming around the corner of the economic fallout uh, from what we've seen. Um, let's move on uh, to another story, uh, shall we, uh, that's getting quite a lot of coverage in the papers today. This is on the front page of the Daily Mirror, uh, talking about game-changer tests for 10 million Brits. Uh, NHS heroes and carers, the first to get these checks to show if they've had 
uh, the virus. Now, these are those uh, antibody tests that the Prime Minister said could be uh, a game changer uh, about a month or so ago. If we just dive inside that newspaper now uh, to have a quick look at the uh, Daily Mirror's uh, coverage, will the test set us free? Um, Alison, will this test set us free? I don't think that this is the answer to all our problems. I think like everything that came before, we've seen the testing um, en masse didn't produce any answers. Maybe the people accepted this antibody test, I think could really be revolutionary in some ways and that it could help people who maybe work in the current profession. We know that the crisis in car homes in many ways was down to the fact that they use very nomadic um, agency staff who were jumping from one car home to another. If they could have the test and they could know that they were safe and that they were able to care for vulnerable people, if we could have the test out in the community so the people who were healthy could know that if they were caring for el elderly relatives or vulnerable relatives, that they weren't putting them at risk when they were going into their homes to care for them. I think that that's where the benefit from this test is, rather than creating, you know, a sort of two-tier um, society of people who have an immunity and those who don't. I think that going forward, that the, the real value in this test is that it will allow people to care for those who will have to remain shielding even after the lockdown is lifted for most of the rest of us. Yeah, it's worth pointing out, isn't it, that um, the NHS and care staff will get it first um, and it could even uh, just be like a week away for, for many people uh, in that um, band. Um, longer wait for uh, the general community, of course. And Peter, how optimistic are you uh, that the antibody test could be a way of unlocking the lockdown? We're optimistic. Optimism is for fools. Uh, it, it will always go wrong. You can see all the characteristics in it of a government scheme that will go wrong. Do we know the test will work? No, we don't. Do we know the government is competent to perform it? No, we don't. Do we know that the people who are actually keeping the records will do it properly? No, we don't. Do we know that the IT attached to it will work? No, we don't. We can therefore assume pretty much that most of those things will go wrong. And it's all based on the, the fact that we've become a mad country. Uh, uh, 30 years ago, I set off uh, on a train to Moscow to go and live in the Soviet Union, which was officially a mad country. But I haven't seen anything like uh, like, as, as, like like this before, even though I, I lived for two years in that in that crazy place. This is a country that's turned upside down. You're presumed now to be ill unless you've got a certificate saying that you're healthy. Uh, we we quarantine the healthy uh, instead of the ill. And we shut down the economy and destroyed the futures of millions on the basis of a virus which actually is probably less serious as an epidemic than several that have swept through this country before, notably the 68-69 Hong Kong flu. I know it's not flu, but it's, uh, the, the effects are in, in many ways similar on the country. We have gone crazy. And all these things are an attempt to overcome the craziness which I don't think will work. We have, to, we have to understand we've made a terrible mistake. Say, we got it wrong, uh, the government scared the population unnecessarily, and we should go back to normal as quickly as possible before we destroy all our livelihoods with, with, uh, with, with shutdowns. Optimism is for fools, according to uh, Peter there. Alison, I noticed that you were tweeting that you were a glass half full kind of girl, so I wonder if you got a bit of a different take on uh, the months ahead. I, I think probably I have a different perspective just because I come from Northern Ireland. I grew up here, you know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s when, you know, we were living under what could be considered a police state. So I'm probably much, much more used to following strange rules and regulations maybe than other people are found in this lockdown. Um, but I think in terms of, of moving out of it, everything needs to be proportionate. So these rules and these this legislation, these regulations, they are draconian. There's no other way to describe them. And they should only be used for as long as they're needed and they should only be used proportionally. I think that that's the important thing, you know, that we move out of this as quickly as it is safe to do so. And the fact is, you know, we shouldn't be sacrificing, sacrificing people and putting wealth over health. I think that's the important thing. A really interesting perspective there. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, Peter, I'm keen to talk to you about a story on the front page of the Financial Times about negative interest rates. Um, how concerned are you about the kind of economic fallout? When we, I mean, it's extraordinary really, that we've been talking about negative interest rates at all. Well, it, it, it is, again, an absurdity. Interest rates are paid on people's savings to reward them for saving with banks. And now people are actually being effectively threatened with being charged for saving with banks. What on earth is going to happen to all the millions of people? This isn't about fat cats, monopoly men with silk top hats and big bellies. This is about for saving. How on earth are pension funds going to survive under these circumstances? It's a very, very 
fascinating and, and, and gripping warning of what's going to happen to our economy once we wake up to what we've done, once the emergency budgets start coming in, once the huge tax rises start coming in, and once all the other long-term effects of this immense spending of, of, of fairy gold by the government on furloughs and, and, and all the rest of the things that they've been doing actually have to be paid for. Uh, negative interest rates are, it, it seems seem to me, to be a, a, a fascinating omen of bad times to come. And it shouldn't just be the second lead on the front page of the Financial Times. It should be on the on the front page of every newspaper and on the top of every bulletin that this is what's happening. Uh, we have done tremendous, probably irreparable damage to our economy by what's been going on over the past few weeks. And we are all going to have to pay for it in many, many varied and painful ways. And this is one of them. Yeah, quite extraordinary uh, warning there. Um, thank you both very much for a very lively uh, first half of the newspaper review. Uh, lots more to come uh, from both of you uh, after uh, this break, because uh, after the break, we'll be talking about schools and if children don't go back to school after the summer holidays, might their parents be able to seek refuge in the pub? We'll bring you both of those stories next. I'm sure many parents will be quite keen to find out the answers. Back. You're watching the press preview with us now, Alison Morris and Peter Hitchens. Uh, thanks both for being there. Uh, still uh, waiting to uh, kick off with the uh, second half of the, of the paper review. And I'm keen to talk about schools. Uh, one of the biggest decisions for any government will be when to advise uh, pupils go back to, to school. Uh, and your paper, Alice, in the Irish News, uh, is saying that the disruption could stretch into a new school year uh, and that only a small group uh, of pupils returning after the summer. Uh, what is the situation in Northern Ireland? We only got news today from the Education Minister as what the plan will be and children won't be going back until September. We do have different school holidays here and the children would usually be off in July and August. And even then, not all children will be going back. We're talking about is it in the return of GCSE and A-level students and possibly primary sevens, but the rest of children will only be in maybe two days a week. And that's disastrous in terms of childcare because at that stage, we would assume that most people will be back at work. Um, most working mothers use school as their childcare. How that's going to work, I'm not quite sure. Um, and also, it's been very difficult for children who come from socially deprived backgrounds who don't maybe have access to online learning. Children who are already falling behind who maybe have disabilities and aren't getting that additional help. And more importantly, I, and I think that more tragically, those who may be in abusive homes who haven't been in touch with their, their school and their teachers and, and haven't had that care throughout that time. It's a long time for a child not to be, not to be in education. Some pr pretty serious uh, consequences, of course, uh, that you mentioned there. Uh, the thing that strikes me as well is just how differently um, different countries, but also different parts of the United Kingdom, are uh, dealing with this too. Um, Peter Hitchens, who do you think is right? Well, I don't, think, I don't think anybody's right. I think the problem is that the government closed the schools by frightening the population uh, with the, the supposed virulence and danger of coronavirus. And they've engendered such fear uh, that it is almost impossible to persuade either parents or teachers uh, to support the reopening of schools. Uh, there simply is a, still an awful lot of resistance to it. Uh, people are terrified of this virus, and they're terrified of the virus because the government, uh, like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, decided it would use fear uh, to distill it into power to get people to behave themselves and hide at home and, and generally obey these regulations, and they created far more fear than they ever intended to. The other day, I was riding my bicycle through a, a very pleasant suburb of Oxford with very wide roads and extremely wide pavements. I was the only traffic on the road. And when hearing the whiz of my chain, I was going about 15 miles an hour, uh, with her two children with her, gathered them up in, in her arms like a mother hen and, and whisked them uh, to the other side of the pavement so they could be further away from me going past at 15 miles an hour. Uh, this level of fear is among intelligent, educated people is terrifying. And until it can be dispelled, then it's going to be very, very difficult to open the schools. And even if you do open them, they're going to be under such restrictions that it's going to be a misery working or learning in them because of keeping people apart and all and drawing chalk, chalk squares around them and the rest of the rubbish that you see in, in, in France, for instance. And the government is only going to end it when it admits that it made a terrible mistake and that it, 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 it hugely overrated the danger and it hugely overreacted to it. Until then, this country is going to be floundering with this kind of thing for the foreseeable future. And the schools will be particularly difficult. And it makes it extraordinarily difficult to reopen business and industry 
uh, when children can't go to school, and it's also hugely disadvantageous to the children of the of, of the of the less fortunate because the, the private schools are coping reasonably well with distance learning, but I don't think the state schools are. So in general, it's a disaster, but it's caused by fear, and it's I, caused by fear which the government needs to dispel. I do feel that I should uh, make the uh, alternative argument here slightly that the government would say that it's the social distancing measures that have uh, brought the uh, death rate down. I know that's something that you would dispute, uh, Mr Hitchens, but I am very keen to squeeze in the last story uh, on pubs as well. I think this will be uh, welcome news for any of those parents homeschooling. The pubs are fighting back. Alison, what's happening? It's interesting because when the South of Ireland introduced the, their um, plan to ease out of lockdown, the most Googled messages were, when will the hairdressers open and when will the pubs open? Um, and I think that, you know, it's one of those those things, especially in Belfast, we had a, a truck that was going door to door and pulling pints of Guinness at people's doors and the PSNI stopped that, said it wasn't an essential journey. But um, publicans have discovered a loophole, so they can give you cocktails, pints of beer, whatever, as a takeout, but just not for you to, to sit in. and. I imagine myself okay. and Peter have very different... I'm going to have to jump in. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very sad we're out of time. A really lively uh, pay-per-view uh, from both of you, so it's much appreciated. Uh, sadly, that's all.